This is because people fail to reach an agreement in their past lives. They unfulfilled their past life tasks, failed to sort things out, and they have to go through the same scenario again in this lifetime. If somebody doesn't love you, you think that you do love that person, just know that you are looking into a mirror. You have the traits that this person is translating to you. The law of the boomerang. You launch one and get ten back. He just looked at me. One transformative glance. There were many other transformative glances that brought bliss up to the experience of Samadhi. We all mirror one another. But we are talking about relationships in a couple. And care for your nearest ones. This is the essence of spirituality. Good afternoon, Master. Today, we suggest exploring the topic of relationships. What we'd like to start with today is that many couples experience disharmony in their relationship. They often have conflicts, scold each other, they share no common interests, however, they still live together. What advice could you give to them on how to improve their lives or what to change? Finding the reasons behind this is paramount. There is a saying, the truth is born in the dispute. You live together, you are very different, your tastes differ, either of you is selfish. The ego would never let one person accept the other, and this is where the lines begin to blur. Over time, as you blur the lines, you lose the ego you used to have. In other words, your ego becomes more subtle, not sophisticated, but subtle. It becomes very refined. So you need to understand the reasons behind the situation, different psychological types. In an ordinary state of mind, people only act in their own self-interest. As the saying goes, they measure other people's corn by their own bushel. Our actions are always driven by self-interest, and we don't live to exercise care about the other person. We oppose them all the time. This is to answer your question about conflicts. It's not only about conflicts, though. Some people even scold each other, and there are many cases in which it comes to blows. This is because people fail to reach an agreement in their past lives. They unfulfilled their past life tasks, failed to sort things out, and they have to go through the same scenario again in this lifetime. There are people who say, look, I've met someone, they mean so much to me, I feel like I need to marry. But it doesn't really mean that you need to marry them. What it means is that you have met a person you knew very well in your past life, and you feel a kinship. Some people tell me, we have so much in common, we share common interests and needs and so on. But it's not interesting to live with someone identical to you. You know everything. What's next? Being different and finding opportunities for coexistence is much more engaging. That's the creative approach. Of course, both scenarios are possible, but here is what I want to say. This is not because couples fail to find an opportunity that they break up, but because they simply don't want to find it because they prefer the external world, they are too attached to material things. We say that they are dependent on external circumstances. For example, people may say that this person is beautiful, but that that one is ugly. But can people be ugly? Could the Creator create something ugly? Do you remember Notre Dame de Paris, where the most beautiful woman of the city fell in love with Quasimodo? Why did she love him? To ordinary people he seemed ugly, but his soul had reached a very high level. His soul was so beautiful that she couldn't help falling in love with him. And if you care for a person, you don't care what they think of you. You have assumed responsibility. A man who assumes responsibility for a woman must bear this responsibility for the rest of his life. 
He assumed this responsibility before God, before his higher self. I'm not saying that from the moment on he has to eke out a miserable existence till his last day, as people say. If you care for someone, make this person firmly stand on his or her own feet. In this case, you can break up. If you and your partner are not on the same page, it means that you fail to find the way to understand each other. Or, rather, you do not want to understand each other. It is always possible to understand a person, but we notice that we understand very well the dog we love or the cat we play with, for example. Some people even say, my dog is far closer to me than any of my relatives. That's nonsense. To a human with correct attitudes, this doesn't make any sense. You can love the dog and the dog will love you back, but it does not exclude you from finding common ground with another person. A human being is superior to a dog. We have seven chakras. People are spiritual beings capable of self-awareness. And if we want to find the reason behind this situation, I think this can serve as an explanation. People fail to find the way because they don't want to find it, they don't want to work on themselves. If you develop compassionate qualities, and they develop when you purify the heart and mind first of all, when purifying the heart and mind, you gradually become compassionate. These are elements of unconditional love. It will change people's behavior altogether. Therefore, we say that we should commit to development, self-development. Every mother prepares for the birth of her child. A preparation for motherhood only takes place in the outer environment, because no one tells her what kind of inner work should be done. Unless there are practitioners committed to spiritual development who could give her advice. However, sometimes they don't fully understand things either. But when you plan to marry someone or cohabit with someone, and even within the family, father, son, daughter, parents, doesn't matter, you should also prepare for this. You made an agreement up high, but you did not consent to leave it unfinished. You agreed to take on a certain role here on earth to find a way, while living together, to complete whatever had been left incomplete in your past lives, gain experience, and reach the level of compassion. This is what you must strive for from the very start. Unconditional love, as the word suggests, pays no attention to what your loved one thinks about you. You are important for this person as someone who transmits certain knowledge and gives opportunities for spiritual realization. If their personality ill-treats you, it doesn't mean you are to do the same. Be sure to complete whatever you are supposed to, because this is your debt. You have agreed upon it. You have made this decision. When you register your marriage, you make a commitment that you will serve each other faithfully and keep other in sickness and in health and otherwise. Such a strange promise. Why strange? Because it's never fulfilled. It's a matter of formality, but that's the way it is. Why is reality different? Because people don't want to understand themselves. Therefore, they don't understand how to learn to love themselves. I'm not talking about selfish love, no, we should love our true selves. When you learn to love yourself, you'll be able to share your love with someone else. And if somebody doesn't love you, you think that you do love that person, just know that you are looking into a mirror. You have the traits that this person is translating to you. Masters demonstrate it perfectly. I'll tell you a story about Satya Sai Baba. I had a chance to be one of the concert organizers for Satya Sai Baba's birthday celebration. There were quite a lot of people, and I listened nearly to everyone during the audition. 
We needed people good at singing, having an ear for music. My guitarist friend and I were in charge. We auditioned more than 200 people, maybe even more. But when the birthday concert began, instead of 200 people, there appeared more than 400 people we had never seen before. People had been rehearsing for quite a long time, very seriously. They had been studying the lyrics. Here, all of a sudden, appeared this crowd, and everything sank into chaos. Just imagine everyone wanted to sit in the front row. These were the devotees, whose devotion went off the scale and completely ignored the desires of their fellow beings. What is the essence of devotion? It's about creating conditions. And if your fellow being really needs it, you create conditions and give up your seat. This is the way of expressing spirituality. But here it was very differently. I won't go into details now, but the most important thing is that I felt very frustrated about it. It was back in 2005. I was angry about the situation to some extent. It triggered my righteous anger. Of course, I was in control of it. I didn't say anything to anyone, but within, it was boiling over. Moreover, some managers of the SAI organization, who objected to many organizational processes and never attended rehearsals, somehow decided that they could also perform along with others and sit in the front row. And those people who were supposed to sing, they had prepared for this. They had been dreaming of being closer to Sai Baba. They had really worked in themselves. They knew the lyrics and how they were to be sung. Because those songs were written specifically for this concert. Those people had to go back. They were simply forced to move back. I saw people sitting in the front row just behind the musicians. They were completely tone-deaf, but they were the managers of the Sai organization, to which many belonged. And they decided that as managers they could sit wherever they wanted, and the rest were to move back. This injustice triggered certain selfish aspects then present in people's consciousness, in their minds and in my mind too. I was very worried about this. Well, maybe not worried, but quite unhappy. The concert began. I sat next to the Brahmin whose role was to open the darshan. I had a keyboard instrument in front of me that I was playing, and several other musicians sat nearby. People felt very frustrated about it and complained. They thought that I was an organizer and could help them. They came up to me saying, how so? We spent so much time rehearsing, and those people are no singers at all. Who will sing then? And I replied, then outvoice them. We need people who can sing. This was an irritating situation, but I did my best to pull myself together because I was performing before God. Sitting there, the Avatar saw and knew everything. I felt somewhat uneasy about this. After the concert began, there was a moment when I looked into the eyes of Satya Sai, and he looked into my eyes too. You don't imagine what happened at that moment. I instantly dropped my gaze because I could not withstand the onslaught of this energy that I felt as my own. This energy can be likened to a sun ray that reflects off a large mirror hitting your eyes, but many times more intense. I couldn't withstand it. I only had enough willpower to avoid mistakes in the music I was playing, to avoid failing the entire orchestra. A mirror. It was the Creator Himself who revealed what I felt at that moment, and it was nearly intolerable, very hard to withstand. Then it quickly disappeared, and I immediately changed my attitude towards it all. He just looked at me. One transformative glance. There were many other transformative glances that brought bliss, up to the experience of Samadhi. 
See the contrast. The same happens between us, ordinary people, between husbands and wives, between brothers and sisters, and people in general. We all mirror one another. When we meet someone, we can feel that this is a kindred soul and we want to continue communication. But such interaction begins to bring our own traits to the surface, because they are mirrored. And we say, no, no, I thought this was a good person, but now I see that there is something wrong with them. I don't like the way they talk to me. I don't like that they don't support me. I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it. And we start looking for someone who will like who we are, and we are caught in the same trap again. Why? Because the whole world is a mirror. We are what we think. We communicate what we've got. What we communicate is what we'll get, and we'll get much more as a gift. The law of the boomerang. You launch one and get ten back. So, I always say, if you alter your attitude toward yourself, the world will change as well. If you change the way you look at the world and yourself, the world will also change for you. This does not mean that you let things slide. This does not mean that you have to endure some kind of aggression, God forbid, or tolerate some kind of injustice. On the contrary, push for justice, push to the end, so that the truth is not trampled in the eyes of others. This is very important, because there is nothing more important than the truth. When there is truth, there is everything else, righteousness, purity, and so on, because truth is God. And what do we see now? Look how people tend to build the relationship. Let's live together for the time being, they say to each other. Then we'll see whether we are the right ones for each other. What good will come of this? No good. So in this respect, I like traditions of the Caucasus. If two persons don't know each other, there's nothing good either. But nevertheless, when the marriage is arranged, the husband assumes the responsibility for the woman and leads till the end as long as he has enough energy. And the woman takes the responsibility to be with her husband and maintain a comfortable and cozy home. She's accountable to her husband and, first of all, to God. The Vedas suggest nearly 108 commitments for a man and a woman, based on the Vedic principles and laws. But what is going on in the world now? Many couples divorce. For example, you won't find the word divorce in the Vedic texts. No word about starting a relationship and then breaking up. But now it happens every now and then because people's attitudes towards each other has changed. Truth and righteousness have become less significant than before. In fact, people don't understand these concepts. Here is how I see this issue. You must treat the person next to you with deep respect, no matter their attitude toward you. It doesn't mean, though, that you must always indulge their every whim. Unconditionally love the person next to you and everyone else, of course. But we are talking about relationships in a couple, and care for your nearest ones. This is the essence of spirituality. And, if in return you do not get what you want and what you give, you must accept the situation. It suggests that you have received too much in your previous life without offering what you would have sought from this person then. And now this person is mirroring you, bringing the same thing back to you. Ordinary minds may consider this to be too simple, but the human mind can now develop any topic to their satisfaction and justify anything. And this justification stems from the influence of the infernal world, where one allows oneself to continue committing immoral deeds by inventing explanations for them. This is where karma steps in.
the law of karma. So here is my advice for people. Before you can make an important decision, do everything you can for this person to feel truly satisfied. As soon as you have a good relationship with your partner, you can break up if you choose to, because you have nothing to grumble at. But if you have nothing to grumble at, what's the point of divorcing? Even more so if you have kids. Therefore, the man must bear this responsibility. He is accountable to God. Thank you, Master.